sophisticated observation. What a magnificent thing. And we've developed it for physics. We've developed it for biology, for neuroscience, for chemistry, for geology. We have not developed it for the mind. We haven't. Shall we assume? Shall we embrace the great big illusion of knowledge? Since we haven't, nobody has. Or to quote a very famous philosopher, but I, to protect his reputation, I will not give him a name. He said, those Christian and Buddhist monks who spend years in meditation, the most that can be said for them is that they're not hurting anybody, but they're basically wasting their time. This is without having spent, I even think, one minute on the meditation cushion himself. But why should one bother when you already know the answer? As the good old medieval scholastic philosophers, we don't need to look through your telescope because if it doesn't conform with what we believe, it can't be true. If it does, we don't need to look. We don't need to meditate because if we, look at, if we meditate and see what we already know to be true, then we already knew it. If we see something that is not confor- does not conform with our assumptions, well, then it couldn't be true. And meditation must be, whatever you see through meditation must be an aberration of your lenses, an artifact of your meditative tradition, probably because you got brainwashed by those Buddhists. But there's a practice that, about what was it, a month ago or so, I spoke of the Shamatha Project with this marvelous team of scientists at UC Davis. One of the practices that I strongly emphasized and many people practiced for up to about a thousand hours in these three months was a practice called settling the mind in its natural state. And it is, in fact, a very simple practice. It is not dogmatically driven. It's a very simple technique. And it entails, I won't give the whole instruction now, but the quintessence of it is... Now, directing your awareness to that domain of experience of uniquely mental events. So you direct your attention away from the visual, the auditory, olfactory, gustatory, tactile. What else is immediately appearing to your awareness that is not physical? Sight, sound, and so forth. What else? Does anything else immediately appear to your senses? In other words, do you have a sixth mode, a sixth mode of perception? Do you have six doors of perception or only five plus inference and imagination? It does astonish me. I hope there are some new textbooks. Maybe Jack Loomis can tell us afterwards. Whether there's some new textbooks in cognitive psychology that actually use the word mental perception. That we actually have six modes of perception, things we directly observe. They're not inferences and they're not just memories. They're happening now. We're observing them now. And they're not coming by way of the five physical senses, such as a mental image, such as dreams, such as many other mental phenomena that arise in this domain of experience that we call the mind. We had people practicing for three months, which is basically, you know, it's summer camp duration. I mean, it's just a nice teaser. Think of studying medicine for three months. Would you like to be, have surgery done to you by a surgeon? who I spent a whole three months doing it. I got my knife, you know. Uh, three months was a really good start. We now have some people just carrying on for months on end, hopefully even for years. But just observing it unflinchingly, unwaveringly, with discerning, clear, intelligent attentiveness, mindfulness, observing it without reacting, with observing it without superimposing, with super, observing without cringing or recoiling, just being present, as that Hubble telescope was just present to whatever was coming in. I'm not saying I like this photon, I don't like that photon. What happens if you do spend, in fact, 8, 10, 12, 14 hours a day? This, in other words, you should be a full-time job. This is like being a medical student. It's all, this is it. This is what you're doing. This is everything. It's this, and then just you know, crash because you're tired. What happens if you do this for 8, 10, 12 hours a day, just observing the mind? Well, it's been done. And what happens is you start to dredge the very, the very space of the mind and you begin to probe, to reveal, to make manifest, to, draw, to illuminate with the light of consciousness phenomena that were previously unconscious. Those 10,000 galaxies in that blank, that dark spot in the sky, they were in the astronomical subconscious. Which means you look and you can't see them until you get a million second second exposure with the best telescope we've ever devised. And then that which was unconscious beyond the threshold of consciousness becomes evident, empirical. Likewise, it has been found that if you put in the hours, put in your million seconds, maybe five or ten million seconds, observing the mind, just settling and settling and settling, it turns out that the space of the mind is three-dimensional. It turns out that there are layers and layers and layers of subtler and subtler phenomena that are normally beyond the threshold of 
consciousness, but not by nature, not intrinsically. There is no barrier, leaden barrier, between the conscious and the, the unconscious. It may be true, as my old friend Howard Fields, marvelous neurologist up in San Francisco, he commented to me in one of our conversations, he said, you know, this was before he did a retreat with me last year, uh, he said, when you practice introspection, he said, you know, I think you get at most maybe 1%, you can observe maybe 1% of what's going on in the mind. My response is, oh, 1%, that's much too, too large, much too optimistic, much less than 1%. Maybe one tenth of one percent. But bear in mind, 3,000 stars with a naked eye and 50 billion galaxies with telescopes. That's, that's a lot less than one percent. What about the space of the mind? I would suggest that it is three dimensional, and the more deeply you probe, the longer your exposure, you start to reveal the inner galaxies of the mind right into the deep space from which they emerge. This deep space the culmination of this process of settling the mind in its natural state, which means uncontrived, unconfigured by personal history, language, culture. The activities of the mind. What happens when the activities of the mind, like the flakes in a snow globe, settle into the ground and the space of the mind becomes transparent? It settles into what in the Buddhist tradition, one of the Buddhist traditions calls the alaya vijnana, or I call it the substrate consciousness, it's a luminous, empty, blissful space of awareness in which your physical senses have completely imploded. It's as if you are deep asleep and luminously awake. Lucid, dreamless sleep. And I have students who have experienced that, even in a three-month retreat. Some people not only had lucid dreams, but would enter into the dreamless state and still be lucid. And what they're experiencing is that substrate, that luminous vacuity, and the awareness of it, which is called the substrate Consciousness, when you achieve it by way of very intensive samadhi practice, the cultivation of very focused, intense, sustained attention, it turns out this is one of the great discoveries by contemplatives. It's not a sectarian issue either. It's just a phenomenological issue that it turns out, lo and behold, that that state of consciousness, when it's sublimely balanced, free of agitation, free of laxity, bliss just pops up. It's saturated by bliss with no blissful stimulus. I'm sure, obviously, something's happening in the brain, but it's not a blissful stimulus that's making you happy. The bliss is arising right out of the very nature of that awareness itself. It's luminous, not in the sense of being bright, like white or yellow, but luminous in the sense of being brilliantly clear, radiantly wakeful. And it's non-conceptual in the sense of being still, profoundly still. So I would say there is a parallel here. This is not an argument, simply a reasoned argument, now you must believe me, but saying here's an experiment as we've had 400 years culminating for the time being in the Hubble telescope and these marvelous observations. Where would we be if we'd had contemplatives over the last 400 years developing a Hubble telescope of the mind to probe the deep space of consciousness? Carl Jung, certainly of this sort, profoundly focused on introspection, not a, f a flatlander when it comes to the mind. And he proposed, about 60 years ago, the existence of a dimension of reality called the unus mundus, a unitary domain of archetypes that can manifest as configurations of mental and physical phenomena. In other words, a dimension of reality that is prior to and then more fundamental than our human constructs, our human bifurcation into mind and matter. Human constructs, where do they come from? Not from nature, uh, from an underlying reality that is more unitary than what, what we're experiencing here, manifesting by way of physical archetypes, by way of mental archetypes, for example, in dreams and elsewhere. A novel notion. He was in, di in a correspondence for something like 20 years, order of magnitude, here, one of the greatest psychologists of the 20th century, in correspondence with one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century, Wolfgang Pauli, Nobel laureate in physics, the conscience of his fellow physicists, especially in quantum mechanics, apparently frighteningly brilliant and could be searingly cutting. When he said, boy, he would reveal it. He was in correspondence with Carl Jung, this brilliant set of correspondence, you can find it, not too hard to find on, on, the, on the web. The two of these collaborated, 
And Wolfgang Pauli, together in this collaboration with Carl Jung, proposed something very similar. Basically, again, it was a collaborative hypothesis. He proposed that mind and matter emerge by a breakdown of the psychophysical symmetry of the unus mundus, this unitary underlying dimension of reality. And in this model, like that that Carl Jung proposed, mental processes emerge as psychic manifestations of archetypes. Physical laws emerge as physical manifest- manifestations of archetypes. But the archetypes themselves are prior to and more fundamental than our constructs of mind and matter. Now, what I found very interesting in this, in this whole correspondence is that Wolfgang Pauli, who terrorized a lot of people, he was just so tough and he was so brilliant, he refused to allow the correspondence, his correspondence with Carl Jung to be published, to be made public. Because he was afraid of the ridicule of his fellow physicists. And I think back to Copernicus, who would not allow his theory to be published until after he was dead. For fear not only of ridicule, but excommunication, who knows, maybe worse. If there is something worse, I'd just, just as soon not be burned at the stake myself. He feared for his life. He feared for his soul. That if he published, the church would come down on him like a ton of bricks. So he said, I'll get out of the way first, publish after I'm out of the way. So instead of publish or perish, it was perish and then publish. <laughs> it's much safer. That's what Wolfgang Pauli did. He did not allow his correspondence with Jung to be published until he was safely in the grave beyond the realm of ridicule, at least that he would have to hear. So that's from physics. Wolfgang Pauli, no no mean physicist, and there have been others after him. Roger Penrose at Oxford University, something very similar. George Ellis in South Africa, something very similar. The notion, especially these brilliant mathematicians, they're asking a question for which... Physicists on the whole don't have an answer, and that is, why is it that the physical universe so sublimely and exactly follows mathematical laws? The inverse square, of gra- inverse square law of gravity, for example, it's down to 100 digits, as many digits as you like. It's really mathematical. How did that happen? Why? Why should the universe be fit mathematical? Who, who said? Why should that be the case? And actually, Penrose and Wolfgang Pauli and some others have proposed, well, maybe that's because it's derivative of a realm of pure mathematics. It goes right back to Pythagoras. Maybe that's why. But again, what, what stumps me here is, I think these are brilliant theories, and they don't seem to have any way of putting them to the test. They've been around. Wolfgang Pauli's theory has been around 50, 50, 60 years by now. Penrose's brilliant theory, but who's got, a, who's got any test? David Bohm, the, implicit or, the Im- implicate order and so forth. Beautiful theory. Where's there any test? Why should we regard this as anything other than very elegant, mathematically informed, philosophical speculation? Where's the test? And the answer is, I don't think we have one. They may be right, but how do we know? Buddhism comes in. Finally, we get some Buddhism. And I need to go a bit faster here. I'm enjoying this so much. I love this material. Buddhism comes in with no telescope and no mathematics and no science of physics or astronomy, but it comes in with some very sophisticated methods for exploring the space of the mind and its relationship with the surrounding environment, the relationship of consciousness and the surrounding environment, and comes up with a proposal that the physical world as we experience it, called the kama datu, the desire realm, the sensual realm, the sensuous realm, but the physical world that we experience, that this is actually an emergent property. It's not fundamental. It's not baseline. It is not that out of which everything else emerges, as almost every biologist would tell you. Rather, it's an emergent property, and it emerges from an underlying realm that is prior to and more fundamental than our human constructs of mind and matter. It's called the Rupadhatu, a form realm. sounds very Platonic, very Pythagorean, actually. The notion of pure forms that are not material, as in chunky, but they are forms, but it's not, just, it's not just a mental realm either. It is something prior to and independent of those from which the physical world emerges. And even this rupadhatu, this form realm, that too is an emergence out of a yet subtler dimension of existence called the formless realm, the arupya datu. One might correlate that with just pure mathematics, with no geometry at all, just pure mathematics and no forms. Where do they come up with it? Is that just one more cool hypothesis that has no way of testing it? And actually, to the contrary, when the Buddha himself came up with this, 
And then 100 generations of yogis after him keep on corroborating the same discovery, because I think it's going on to this present day. This actually is a theory that comes directly from experience. Rather than mathematical analysis and brilliant ingenuity, it's coming out of the cultivation of samadhi. Very, very deep meditative states, highly focused, where the psyche shuts down, the the psyche implodes into the substrate consciousness, and the substrate consciousness is like a portal to the form realm. Go get sutra, that is a portal to the formless realm. And all of these have been exhaustively mapped. But you need a lab for that. A friend of mine, John Cohen, out at Princeton, I think it was Harvard, wanted to lure him away from Princeton. And so Princeton said, please stay. My wife is going through something similar to this, but a little bit less money involved. John Cohen, world-class cognitive neuroscientist. He's at Princeton. Harvard wants him. Princeton said, please stay. We'll give you $500 million. $500 million to build your own lab. Will you stay? He said, yeah. <laughs> so that gives you a really good lab. I saw him in IBC News just a couple of days ago. $500 million lab up, up and coming. You can do some really good research, better than with a $10 million lab. What kind of a lab do you need for that? About five million would do it if you brought your checkbook with you. Uh, But it does need some kind of a conducive environment. To do this two hours a day after a long day's work, you'll get about as much progress as doing astronomy two hours a day after a long day's work. It needs a lab. It needs an environment. It needs support. But they had it in classical India. They had it in Tibet. They still have it in some regions of Tibet. 